Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us for today's Missouri Virtual VCP. I want to start by introducing our surgeon faculty who will be performing today's case, Dr. Jeffrey Gum with Norton Leatherman Spine in Louisville, Kentucky. Uh, Dr. Gum is a thought leader in spinal robotics. Um, so just a huge thank you to Dr. Gum and his entire team for letting us, uh, allowing us in their OR this morning. Um, and before I turn it over to Dr. Gum, I just want to quickly introduce um, a couple of surgeons that I see we've got joining us this morning. Um, Dr. Miles Singer, Dr. Rupert Kett White, uh, Dr. Daniel Reed. Um, I apologize if I've missed anybody, but I just want to welcome you guys uh, to this morning's broadcast and um, introduce you to Dr. Gum. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. Gum. Welcome, everyone. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss uh, our robotic assisted technology today. So, what we're going to do is I'm going to go through the a couple of slides in PowerPoint real quick, and then I'll go through the plan on the planning station, um, and then uh, I'll scrub in and we'll get going. My fellow and PA are currently exposing and getting everything set up, so it looks like we're going to be right on time. So the case for today is uh, a 46 year old female with low back pain and bilateral leg pain, so it's 60 40 back first leg. Been going on for about two years, but last six months have been uh, uh, pretty detrimental to her. So she spelled all the typical non up stuff and had at least six injections. I actually think a couple of those have been facet or medial branch blocks. Previous decompression unilaterally at L4, L5, ODI 68, VAS leg is eight, back is nine. And so if you look at our radiographs, there's uh, a, a subtle spondy at four, five. There's some asymmetric disc collapse at four, five, and five, one. If you look at the uh, MR and CT, she's got some central stenosis at four, five. You see the asymmetric disc collapse in the coronal in the, in the center. And then you see the vacuum disc at four, five, and five, one. Uh, she had a, a CT at an outside institution. Um, I, I get a CT after I do my anterior work, which I'll go through that workflow with you guys. But I, I do try to pay attention and not uh, over radiate them. Um, so our plan today is uh, um, a stage L4 to S1, sorry for the extra element, L4 to S1 O lift slash A lift. So that was done yesterday, right? So we did uh, put a cage in at 4.5, put a cage in at 5.1, and then I actually stand them up, walk them, uh, reassess their radiculopathy. That allows me to be more efficient with my decompression work, especially in a revision setting. My practice has a very high percentage of revision patients, probably about 50 or 60% of my practice has had a surgery somewhere else. And so I hate going through uh, scar and epidural space. And so if the radic is gone, uh, sometimes I'll actually do a PERT case. Uh, if the radic is still there, or part of it's still there, uh, we try to do a real detailed assessment of where it's bothering them. So we're a lot more efficient with our decompression on the back versus just opening everything up. Uh, fixation wise, we're going to do cortical screws from L4 to S1. I'll go through a couple of slides of why this is my per preferred fixation for one to three level uh, degen type cases. So here were some fluoro shots yesterday. Uh, we did a Titan style titanium cage at 5.1. Again, this was all in an O lift approach. So a patient was right lateral to cubis or uh, right side down. And then we did use a pivot cage at 4.5. I do like to put a screw through. Uh, the inner body devices and or use a plate just to keep the cage from kicking out because I do get them up and mobilize them. Um, I, if I was doing the same day or single position, I would not add the screw in the cage or the, or the plate. Um, so a little bit about registration options. So the two registration options for this is so the technology is CT based, right? So although the software is capable to read MRs, there's the logistics behind that. So it's CT based at the moment. Um, and so you either get a preoperative CT scan or you get an intraoperative CT scan with the OR. Uh, my preferred workflow, about 98% of the time we do a preoperative CT, that allows us to plan prior to the OR or it, uh, while incisions being done, incisions being done. Also, uh, when I was uh, lobbying for us to get this technology, um, it, we ended up figuring out that it's a decent revenue stream for the hospital that any folk, any patients that's, that are getting this, uh, they get a CT at our institution because that is a specific protocol. Um, we, uh, we take call and operate at uh, about six different hospitals. And so our system, uh, after a couple of weeks of discussion with them, pretty much anybody that gets a lumbar or thoracic CT scan for spine purposes, 
uh, they get this protocol, which is just one millimeter slices. So it's not that difficult to have your system convert to use this protocol. Um, uh, I do use scan and plan. Rarely somebody travels in and they're trying to get out of town and we're trying to avoid insurance hassle with CT scans. And uh, But for the most part, I do CT to pull out. Here's our CT scan after the inner body work, right? So the software is slick enough and smart enough that you can get a pre-op CT scan, do your inner body work, and then register with those cages in, even though they weren't in the pre-op CT. Because, because of the registration um, and the capabilities of the software, it will still recognize it, even if you've done an osteotomy, a T-lift, or anterior work. But in efforts to minimize the chance of error, um, I typically get the CT after the inner bodies have been placed, uh, especially if they have not had a pre-op CT. In this case, that pre-op CT was done at an outside facility, so it was not the, the right protocol. That's why I ended up getting one after the anterior work was done. So a couple comments on my preferred fixation for getting these one to three levels. So mid-lift, I kind of fell in love with this approach a couple of years into practice and initially was doing it with navigation and then incorporated this technology and what I found is when you think about incorporating enabling technology, you really need to pay attention to your workflow. So, you know, when you do cortical screws, since you don't have that cancellous channel, most people, if not everybody, nobody freehands these screws, right? So you need some sort of assist technology, either fluoroscopy or navigation. When I incorporated ro robotics, it became substitutive. So it didn't just add extra time out of the gate. It took a step away and add step steps in. So um, that's a good, good rationale for incorporating this workflow, at least to start. Number two, uh, you guys will hear me comment several times uh, this morning, uh, several times this morning, as far as failure points, right? So I don't, I, I'm super excited about this technology. I love this technology. But everybody I talk to and teach, I try to explain where this technology could potentially get you in trouble. It's still your surgery, still your patient, um, still your OR. So the, if you don't know the limitations of the system, you're going to end up get hurting somebody and get burned. And so the failure points are typically shift and skive, and I'll go through ways to minimize those. But one of the things to consider is this is perfect for PERP. This is perfect for MIS. This is great for big constructs. But before you jump to cases like that, you want to do cases that you start to learn and trust the technology, right? So when you do these mini open approaches, um, you get to see with cortical screws, you get to see the cannula dock on the bone. You get to see the drill go in that spot. You get to see the screw go in the spot where the drill was, right? So you get to trust the system before you jump to a port case where you're really relying on the navigation feedback to, to let you know where you're at or, or trusting the robotic technology. An analogy I always use, it's a Tesla, right? So when I give a lecture like this live, I always ask how many people in the audience have a Tesla? And you know that, that number's growing as far as the folks that raise their hand. Then I ask who used the autopilot off the lot, right? And, and even if it's available, nobody's gonna do that. You're not gonna buy a car that you've never driven hop in it and just let it take you home without getting used to the car. So same concept, get used to the technology, trust it, but gradual earn trust. Number two, like I said before, understand the failure points, which are shift and skive. And where I really advocate to, as you're learning this, to watch that cannula bone interface to trust the system. And, and then you can start to really push the limits of, of its capabilities. The third reason why this is a really good entry of robotics into your practice and, and a good way to incorporate this into your practice is incision planning and optimization. Right, so if you look here at this cortical screw construct that was planned, the single level mid left, right? There's a lot of real estate in that sagittal plane that you can manipulate your trajectories and still uh, accomplish your same goal. And so you know, if you see there, I, I have those intersect on the skin to really minimize my skin incision. I also have my line of sight for my inner body work or decompression work incorporated in that. And that really allows us to make a smaller incision. My cortical screw construct on the left is really how I started, right? So both were up and out. Over time, I realized that I didn't need to make a big inc uh, uh, incision that big because my distal or mid construct screws really can go through the facet, right? We prep the facet, we do a fast technique, so it's really not going through, it's not pinning the facet in place, but it, you can violate that facet and still accomplish good fixation without any detriment. Your UIV, obviously you have to avoid that facet and really be aggressive up and out. 
And so a couple of things, this has allowed us to minimize our incision and also our, conch, our screw size, our average screw size has gone from, you know, maybe five, five thirty-fives to really the average is a six, five forty. Today, we have some pretty small pedicles, the uh, patient's anatomy is pretty small. Here's a uh, three level construct that you can see everything intersects on the skin. So we were able to accomplish this uh, uh, three level fusion with eight fixation points via seven centimeter incision. And the middle image shows that kind of trans facet plan for the mid construct and distal screws. That facet doesn't look like that when we actually put the screws in, we prepped it, but there's no reason why you can't violate that with regards to your fixation. Um, so those are reasons why uh, this is a really good intro to consider uh, rolling robotics into your practice. Here's an upright image of that. Here's another upright image of a, uh, another case. And here's a great two spawny, a similar concept. So a couple images that uh, uh, just to show some post-op film. So I'm going to head over to our planning station now. Um, and then we're going to go through a couple concepts here. Right. So you click on each segment um, over here on the right. So L4, L5, S1. This is the new version of the software. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to be on the front of the line. They get the new 5.0 or Eagle version of the software. So it's a great layout. So on the left, you have this holistic construct, uh, right, which is a, a really good way to promote this, right? When you start to think about construct planning, right? I've really minimized the coronal bend in the rods and the kind of wonky tulip placement that makes life a little bit more difficult when you go to place your rods because we change this in the AP view to make sure things line up. It's not a big deal when it's two levels, but if you're doing multiple levels, that really makes life a, a lot easier. So we're looking at L4, right? So uh, we want to avoid that cranial facet. So what I'm looking at here is where my entry point is. It's below the facet on the pars. And we see we got a nice flat landing surface. A lot of times with these cortical screws, we're over here just off to the pars, which uh, increases the sky potential. Um, and we have five, five forties that we're going to start with. Uh, it's pretty aggressive up and out that you can see on the sagittal plane. The other thing that you see here is when I was doing this with navigation, I just paid attention to my real estate unilaterally. Now, if I change the position of one screw, I change the contralateral screw to get them to marry up. And so my ladder actually typically looks a lot sexier. Not that it changes anything clinically, but uh, uh, looks good for you and the patient. And we're gonna scroll down to L5 here. Uh, and again, you see that we could actually violate that facet that's been prepped, right? Um, uh, bigger screws here, we have 6535s, but, um, and then we'll go down to S1 right here. Um, and we can see our antibodies placed and we have 6535s here. So a little bit smaller screws than what we're used to. If we look at the overall construct flow, you can see how everything converges on the skin to allow us to make a small incision. Our incision's a little bit bigger today than what uh, we typically do. Uh, uh, for reasons that I won't disclose, but the, uh, my fellow MPA are great, and they typically really minimize that incision. A lot of times we'll do a pre-op lateral x-ray to help center that incision where we intersect on the skin. All right. Uh, so that was a lot of talking in a short amount of time. I'm going to go scrub, um, and then I'm going to go through mounting the robot and uh, our fixation points and go through those steps. So if anybody has any questions, now would be a good time to fire a couple off. Hey, Dr. Gum, while you're scrubbing in, um, you mentioned trust earlier and, and gradual trust at that. Um, yep. How many cases would you say it took for you to truly get comfortable with the technology? Um, and maybe for folks on the line who are considering adopting robotics, how many cases they would they should expect to go through uh, to get through yeah. that learning curve? Yeah, so perfect question, Nicole. So a couple of things, you know, I, I want anybody interested in this technology wants to be successful with it. And the two things that I really think that the three things that I think are really critical to make it successful is number one, to understand those failure points, which I've talked about, we're going to go through in detail. Number two is realistic expectations, right? So if you think that you're going to use this technology in, in the first in the first case, the first case, um, the first case is is going to be faster, quicker, and everybody's going to love it. That's not realistic. I mean, it happens, but um, at our center it was really case number seven or eight, where we looked around and the room was like, "Wow, this is pretty cool," and everybody moved more efficiently. Um, we dissected that and tried to look at that de data and have considered publishing it, but I think it's a little unfair because um, I had a lot of time in the lab to get to play with it. I spent some time with my team up front. I kind of handpicked my team uh, to make sure that they were all interested in it. And so 
realistically, I think it's about 10 to 15 cases re between before the average person or the, the commonly people are like, okay, yeah, I, I trust the technology. I feel good about it. And so I think that learning curve is somewhere between 10 and 15. And the literature says it's anywhere from zero to about 25. So I don't think zero is a good expectation to set. Um, the other thing to help be successful, I think uh, choosing the appropriate cases to start, right? So a lot of folks are interested in this and their longer constructs, and it's great for that. But if your first case out of the box is a T2 to the pelvis, you're going to find that uh, there's a lot of things that you wish you would have learned before you start to bite something off that big. And so uh, appropriate case selection goes a long way. Um, and those are the three, three points to really help be successful. This is Mohammed Kendall from Somerset. Um... Thanks for uh, for the nice talk so far. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so what you did? So you did L5 S1 A lift and L4 uh, L5 O lift. Then now you save the patient from the back. Is this what you're doing now? Correct. Correct. So yesterday we did the O lift uh, four five and five one. Uh, yeah. And 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 I get them up. I walk them. I assess the radic and I get that CT scan for planning afterwards. That's a typical workflow for me. And I realize that's not a realistic workflow for everybody. Um, one for stacked OR days. And what we're looking at is, it, are we increasing medical complications by staging those patients like that? Um, in, the, in the deformity literature, there's a ton of work showing that staging those types of front back procedures um, is actually minimizing medical complications, but nobody's really looked at it or published well with regards to DGEN. So there's definitely a lot of holes and arguments about this. We just had a big debate at Spine Tech Summit. To me, the biggest yeah. thing is, is one, understanding when you can trust your indirect decompression, because there's a lot of push for single position surgery, which is fine if, if you understand that pathology and you know you're going to get rid of that redict. But in a revision yeah. setting where there's a lot of scar tissue, what I found the biggest benefit for me, besides OR predictability and planning, is the fact that I spend less time, you know, if somebody has imaging that looks God awful and there's a ton of scar back there because somebody has been back there one, two, three times and I get them up after my anterior work and that redick is gone. I'd spend way less time in the, in that epidural space around that scar tissue, which just minimizes complications. Yeah. makes sense. Yeah. That's a very, very good way to think about it. Okay. Thanks a lot. So yeah, even, um, just one more thing. So you do not um, like you do not put any cages from the back with your horse, like T lift or T lift or something, or yeah, yeah. So so I do. I love a mid lift procedure, right? And so you know my go to for single level is a mid lift, unless the bone is horrible. I for yeah. some reason I hate multi level T lifts, right? I would rather do a T ten in the pelvis than a two level T lift, and I, I really can't put my finger on that. Besides. You know, the the predicted when I look at at least our center in my workflow, the T lift component of a single level T lift doesn't consume 75% of the time, but it consumes 75% of the variability. Right. So when you're when I'm trying to do five, six cases a day in multiple rooms and three or four of those are T lifts, what I found is, you know, a T lift component could go super smooth, no issues, or it, you know, we run into epidural bleeding, exposure, et cetera. And it doesn't consume 75% of the time, but it was 75% of my variability. And so again, not the only reason why to do front back and stage these folks, you know, alignment issues, a lot of other things. But when you're looking at OR predictability, right? So if I do my anterior work and then now all I'm worried about is my fixation and a decompression plus or minus that component of it, that is very predictable and the day flows unbelievably well, right? I, I don't, I, you know, so yesterday we did two of these, uh, uh, two uh, robotic assisted mid -lifts, And I love that procedure, super small incision, super good workflow, but one of them went super smooth. The other one, we got into some epidural bleeding and a dural tear and that took away longer than expected. So, you know, it, it's just, that's a lot of, uh, that's the variability in that procedure. So great questions. All right, so from a mounting perspective, I'm gonna turn the lights away so you guys can see a little bit better. If I'm running into issues, uh, I'll turn the lights back. So uh, it's not always fair to operate in the dark the, the majority of the time. Um, so mounting options. So their system is table mounted, right? So competitor systems are floor mounted. 
A lot of people ask you what the benefits and downfalls to that are. To me, the two big failure points are shift and sky, right? So shift is translation of the patient relative to the system after you register. One of the ways to really minimize shift is a robust connection between table system patient, right? So the four mounted uh, systems, I think, have a way higher likelihood for shift because you're not connected to the patient as robustly. So uh, the other thing that people ask is how easy is it to pull on and off the bed? Typically, when we're doing this, I have two, three, four of these cases, and we bounce the robot from room to room while the patient's still on the bed. So our workflow is expose, mount, do fixation, why another room starting to expose, we take the robot off the table, it bounces into the other room. And so it's easy to pull on and off the table. That's got a hydraulic pump. So your NRC doesn't have to have, uh, doesn't have to be able to bench press 400 pounds to be able to take it on and off. Um, and so as far as mounting it to the patient, there's a lot of different options. For longer constructs, there's a bunch of spinous process clamps. Um, I prefer for these smaller, smaller procedures to mount to the, uh, with the PSIS pin. So you feel for the PSIS, right, which is typically not hard to find. Sometimes in Kentucky, it's not the easiest thing in the world, but we feel the PSIS, we make a little stab incision. There's three different pin options as far as sizes. There's 80, 120, and uh, 150. So 80 is a great day, great tech. 120 is a mediocre day and 150 is not a good day, right? So today we're, it's a mediocre day. We're using a 120 pin based on the patient's anatomy and body habits. So when you put this pin in, right? So small incision, I just feel for bone. Um, one of the big things is you want to make sure that this connection to the patient is nice and robust. And so if that pin is sticking way up off the skin and you mount the robot to that, that lever arm's huge, right? And so you're way more likely to have shift issues. That's the case. So I like to hub it on the patient. The other thing, I don't know if you guys could see this, but when I toggle this pin, if that pin is moving prior to the patient and robot and table moving, that fixation is not, not, not robust enough. And so what I like to do is toggle this pin. I don't want to make it loose, but that gives me an idea how robust it is. If I see playing the pin before the table patient or robotic arm moves, I'm going to advance it in a little bit more. And so, and if you're truly in the PSIS, you have a lot of real estate in there as far as uh, how deep you can put that pin. So here we go. We're going to toggle the pin. We see the robotic system. We see the patient. We see everything moving as one big unit. So now we're going to go down and we're going to place that, that um, um, the connector on the pin, right? And bring the robotic arm in. It connects via, this is called the bone mount bridge. Uh, there's a couple of different arm options as well. Uh, a couple of times I've used uh, dual PSIS pins for longer constructs that go all the way up to like upper thoracic spine, because I think two points of fixation are, is really robust or the spinous process clamps that span, you know, multiple spinous processes. The other thing, just like I was checking with that pin, go ahead and wrap it around there. Um, once everything is mounted, I grab this bone mount bridge and I toggle the whole thing. And what I see is the bed, the robotic system, the patient all moving in unison. So very little chance for shift when you have a robust connection like that. All right. Next step, uh, I'm going to go and put this in now because it's not bleeding. And so we've done our exposure. We've done facetectomies already. Um, our skin incision, I would say, is probably double our, our typical size. Um, we're gonna do a, what we call a three defined scan. Um, go ahead and put that down here. So you place blue towels down. And so eyes on the end of the robotic arm now scan the field, right? So it's trying to figure out the topography of, of what's going on. If you guys noticed, I left my retractors in, right? So from day one, I've always tried to keep my retractors in. Watch that camera case. Um, and so the reason I like to leave them in for, is for two things. One, they stand up a little proud, right? And so these series of shots that the system's taking right now is to calculate two things. One, to figure out the surface so that it doesn't drag the arm from one trajectory to the other and bump into things, right? So if your retractor's not in there, in theory, you put it in afterwards, it doesn't know it's there and it, it could be close enough to the patient that it drags across it, but that's, that's pretty rare. It stays far enough away. Number two, it's calculating the most efficient pathway. The And so the other reason why I like to leave the retractor in, if, if you guys have had big exposures and you pull on that fascia, that posterior fascia, you shorten the column, 
and you actually change the alignment of the spine. So it never made sense to me to do my exposure, do my registration. And the first thing I did is just instantly change the alignment by putting my retractor in. And so, you know, I use a Mercola retractor, which is pretty powerful retractor. You can use other retractors and not necessarily do this, but I'd like to leave it in. It's probably about one to 2% of the time that it interferes with registration and we end up having to take it out and repeat the registration process. But it's been pretty rare for these, uh, for these smaller constructs. So we just finished our uh, topography scan, right? So now it generates an image. If you can look there, that is the surface. So you typically just use blue or green towels for that. You wanna make sure no light's shining on it. So the next step is what's called a snapshot. So what you do is you put a reference array on the end effector of the robotic arm. So it's got navigation beads, just like the navigation frame that's up here, it's not on a patient anymore. So now we have the nav frame up here. And so what this does is it connects the robotic system, right? The robotic intelligence to the navigation intelligence. So it marries the navigation and robotics set up together. So it's just a button that case clicks. That sounds like a camera, nice feature they added. Um, and now we have navigation and the robotic system married together. Next up, we use a turkey foot or chicken foot, I was told it should be called. And we're just showing the system where the area of interest is. And so we hold it at the top of the incision, bottom of the incision. Go ahead and come on in, Christine. And so now we're gonna do our registration steps. So we timestamp all this and we've been doing it ever since our first case. Um, and you guys will see, well, I'll keep my fingers crossed and uh, that typically this is not very time consuming. My thought process was I wanted to beat my O-arm and navigation components um, um, when I started to incorporate this and beat my partners as far as that navigation registration time uh, with, with the O-arm. So there's a series of beads within this grid. So you do two shots, you do an AP shot and then you do an oblique shot. Um, and those two shots allow you to get your registration. One component of this that people do not point out, right? So right now it's a very hot question by my fellows that says, hey, my hospital system says, I could buy you a stealth station and O-arm versus a robot, which do I get, right? I think that's easy because you get both components in this setup. And what people don't discuss is I get to navigate in three-dimensional space with two 4 shots, right? That is huge. There's a lot of companies that tried to accomplish that and did not accomplish it very well. But we take one 4 shot, which we're done with. We're getting ready to take a, a second shot. The other thing, I don't know if you guys saw, I added some betadine into the wound, the betadine component just for the you know, infection while it's sitting. But having liquid in your exposure does help uh, the system recognize things a little better. Um, now we're gonna do our oblique shot. Table up, please. Another thing you notice from a radiation exposure perspective, so this is two shots, sometimes three or four, based on uh, trying to get everything lined up. But we try to center x-ray over the grid. Based on the spacing of the grid, and um, the, the system's able to calculate and register these vertebral bodies independently. So that's what, another thing that's unique about this system is the segmental registration. I can change the alignment of those vertebral bodies in relation to each other, and the system still recognizes it. It's very powerful software. So when I was looking at you know, systems that I was interested in, to me, the software is where the heart is. And if you get the software right, the, the potential is unlimited as far as where we can take robotics. And so the software is unbelievably uh, uh, amazing. There's times where we're looking at the oblique and AP and we can't decipher a damn thing that's on the screen and there's somehow some way that the system's able to register it. You know, a couple questions have come up as far as the workflow with anterior versus uh, uh, anterior. So we're all green. Um, early on, early versions in the software, probably three versions uh, of, of the software ago, if I had a big soft tissue envelope, so an obese person with bad bone, so careful. Uh, so obese, oh, 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 uh, big soft tissue envelope uh, and bad bone density, that mismatch between the tissue, table down, please, all the way down. 
um, we were having some issues with registration. What I found if I added my inner body or any sort of hard reference point like that, the software was able to pick it up pretty quickly. So that was another reason why I kind of fell into this workflow um, when I had folks with really bad bone that were a little bigger than uh, we would like. All right, so that was our Thank registration. What was, yep, what was our registration time case real quick? Three minutes. So three minutes of registration time. We're super efficient with OARM in and out at the center because we use it probably, I think we have three, uh, seven stealth stations, three OARMs, um, but that beats anybody's OARM in and out time. Uh, go ahead, Nicole. Yeah, absolutely. Three minutes is incredible. Um, we did have a question come in. So does the robot compensate for patient movement during surgery? No. So if, if you register, and something in the patient moves, um, the system is not gonna, you can re-snapshot, you can re-register, but the system is not gonna detect that and compensate for that in current state. All right, go ahead and send it to uh, left L4. All right, so we've talked about ways to minimize shift. So now I'm gonna talk about ways to minimize skive. And so the new updated version is really mitigated skive. I mean, it's insane that, uh, that we didn't start out with this workflow, but the original workflow, the cannula that I'm showing you guys right here, had these really sharp teeth on the end. And what we would do is we'd place the cannula down and we would engage it to the spine. But what we, and I promoted the hell out of those teeth being super sharp and the light taps and grab the spine. And once it's all connected, you're really unlikely to skive or shift, right? But what we found is those teeth and the force to engage that in the spine was probably pushing the spine out of the way, right? The, the, the arm's not going anywhere, but we were probably on a sub millimeter level, pushing the spine out of the way and pinning it in place and then doing all our, our accumulation and screw fixation process. So now the new updated version, and we were using power as a, as a, for the drill bit to cannulate the, the pathway. So now we have no teeth, we put the cannula in, it hits the bone again in this mini open or typically mini open approach. We get to see this. What I like to do is I'd like to push down on that cannula just real lightly. And I'm watching this end effector right here, right? That that's my sky detector. If I push down and I see this shift, it tells me it's wanting to sky. It's wanting to go off access. Again, most of the time it's not clinically relevant, but you want to be able to detect when it's going to happen and mitigate if, if that, if you recognize that. So I push down here, I see no movement in that. So I'm pretty confident that it's not going anywhere. Perfect. The new version of this, now instead of power ease that rotates at 250 RPMs, now we use Midas that has a reference array on the end of it. This, ro this rotates at 75,000 RPMs. And so you can be on an unbelievably oblique surface and this just really minimizes the chance for sky. And so you see our planned access, which is the yellow and the green, right? And this is our blue and green coming in. This is our real time access right here, right? The other thing that uh, nav heavy users need to get used to is if you look at the distance from really where we are to where they're referenced away, that's a long distance because of the cannula, the end effector, et cetera. And so as you add weight up here, right? So there's gotta be some play in the system for this to be able to come in and out of the cannula. So, you, you know, I'm looking at center, center to start and then I move, I trust the system. I know the system, I've been doing it long enough. Who's got the pedal? Um, yeah, so, but I like to see center, center, but if it's off a little bit, you really need to kind of take the weight off of the end and understand that lever arm. And sometimes we'll do that with the drill because the, the or the power ease because that's heavy on the end of it. So we see we're center, center right there, full speed. I pull it off the bone. This goes to 30 millimeters. That's our depth stop right there. I can't go any deeper than that. I pull this out. If you want to tap, you can tap, right? I hate being inefficient in the OR. Right. And so when I was using Solera fixation, I had to tap if it was larger than a 5.5 screw. I moved to this ATS style fixation. I don't know if you guys could see this on the screen or not, but it is a real aggressive taper. And what happens is that 3 0 drill bit that I just put in, this goes right into that hole that I just made. Right. And now I get to use power ease to walk that right down. Uh, to, uh, power ease to walk that right down. 
into the hole that I just created. I get to see it go in that spot, right? So I know that it didn't go off access. The other thing, there we go. Yep, so there's our fixation, maybe a little bit deeper than we planned, but we're still avoiding that finial facet. Now we disarticulate that with the threads. This gold knob allows you to do that. Then you go to pull this off. If I pull that off and clear that tool up and I see a big shift in this black end effect, right? My sky detector, I know that I went off access a little bit, right? So all eyes, you know, as the year progresses and I teach the fellows how to do this, um, and I kind of stand back towards the end of the year and let them do this, I'm always paying attention to this, this end effect. That's what's going to let you know if you're going in a position you're not expecting. So we, I typically start with my UIVs because those are the most likely places that we have found. Again, center, center right there. Full speed, very low force. Very low force that I'm putting on this and just letting it kind of melt that bone away because it's spinning at 75,000 RPM. Right, that comes out straight to screw. And this is a 3-0 drill bit straight to a 5-5 screw. Our other screws are a 6-5. You know, there's debate whether you should tap or not tap in traditional pedicle screws. There's even a bigger debate in cortical screws of whether you should tap line to line or tap one below. Not many people are talking about not tapping at all. We're up to about 300 uh, screws with this workflow, this two-step workflow and uh, knock on wood, but we've yet to have a pedicle or parse fracture because of it. Um, and we've gone from 3-0 drill bit to 7-5 screw, 7-5 screw and not have issues. So we're gonna go to our next one. So as you can see, this two-step workflow, cannulate screw is typically a pretty efficient workflow. And we spend, if I'm not talking, uh, we spend similar amount of time on this compared to, um, uh, compared to our exposure and or registration. All right, so again, canola down. If I push here, you can see this end effector wanting to move a little bit. It's probably a half a millimeter or a millimeter. I don't know if you guys can see that on the camera, but that's letting me know it's wanting to sky, right? So what I do, I pull that cannula back. I make sure that burst fit in full speed. And I lightly tap that to get started in that center center position. Right, and that goes all the way down, stops at 30. One thing you need to be careful with is if you're tapping, there's not a depth step on the tap. There's a, a, a guide that tells you the depth you're going in, but you could almost blindly shove that um, Midas in for cannulation. And uh, if you go to tap, you can't just blindly shove it in because uh, there's nothing that's gonna stop you. So again, as the screw goes in, you can see that it, may, it looks like it's off a little bit from our plan. But a lot of that is the weight of this power use. If you could see, you see how I'm changing that position on the screen? It's not changing down here. That's the weight of the system up here. So nav heavy users get a really stuck on that, but you need to pay attention to how the how everything's working. And that makes sense to you. All right, so now we're gonna go to our S1 fixation. We're gonna minimize that much and that much. When's Ben coming back on my service? <laughs> My fellow that's helping today is uh, has been on a maximally invasive service, and so uh, we're going to blame my partners for for the exposure size today. All right, again, there's our S1. This is what a six five thirty five. The other thing from an efficiency perspective, right? So I don't know if uh, other centers track the cost of pans. But at our center, every pan we pop is eight, 180 to 200 bucks, right? So you minimize your screw caddies because we plan. We know every screw size. Now we can sterile pack and open the six screws that we plan. And the team is a step ahead because they know what's coming next. So here's our next one. Again, push down on the cannula. We see that it's wanting to shift a little bit or sky a little bit. So again, just high alert that this is uh, on an oblique surface where it's landing. So if we look there, again, center, center, and pull this off the bone, full speed, very little force. So I'm not deviating the cannula or pushing the spine out of the way. There's our bottom right there. Come out, straight to screw. The other thing, I really like to use power ease for this because it's nice one continuous motion. 
if you hear that whine, which is probably hard to pick up through my earbuds, that's letting me know that that screw bone interface is good, right? And what happens is if it's really grabbing it, when you go to put this in neutral, there's a little kick. That kick by itself is not a big deal, but you do that 10 times and you're likely to manipulate the spine relative to where you started with your registration. So if you do it by hand and the bone's really good, you'll see this kind of that every time you're reloading the driver, you're, you're twisting that segment, right? And so you increase the chances that you're gonna be off access uh, because you shift. And so Power Ease is nice and continuous. And if I hear that wine really winding up, telling me that that screw bone interface is really robust, I actually leave my tulips proud, right? And I'll put them all in, start them in the right spot. And then I'll go back once they're all in, clear the arm and I put them in all the way, uh, I put them into the depth I want by hand. Just another tip to really minimize the chance that you're going off access. So here's screw number six. Did we call x-ray? All right. So typically, once I put screws in, I do a flat plate x-ray, AP and lateral, stem the screws um, just to make sure an EMG in our region is a standard of care. And so... I've continued to use that, um, but I'll, I'll do EMG or I stem them um, and then APM auto x-ray. And as long as I like the screws, I go ahead and dismount the robot, send it to the next room. Uh, we may bring Floro in. Uh, to, are we still hooked up with Floro? Yeah. So we could bring Floro in and look, I just don't like the, uh, um, the resolution of our Floro systems, I think they're about 20 years old for my final confirmation as far as screws go. But we could go ahead and take a lateral, um, a lateral with the Floro and AP um, if anybody shows up on X-ray. All right, questions. So that was six screws. How long, Case? 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Five of that was socking. So, um, uh, so three minute registration, 10 minute screw insertion for, for six screws. Typically what we found are, 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 yeah, we'll go ahead and send. Typically what we have found, our, our screw insertion time is about 50 seconds per screw, 50 seconds to a minute. So I got to train with one of the godfathers in surgery, uh, probably the one of the best freehand uh, people, at least I've been around, and his time was about a minute, or sorry, yeah, about a minute per screw with Larry, or excuse me, Dr. Lenke. And so the fact that I'm uh, getting an opportunity to beat his pace with technology like this makes me very happy and probably doesn't make him as happy since I'm having to use this technology, but it does make life uh, a little easier. Any other questions coming in, Nicole? Yeah, Dr. Brum, we did have a question come in and I, I don't think you mentioned whether or not you had experience with stealth. Uh, navigation prior to robotics, but um, in your experience, how does using the robotic system compare to using OARM and stealth for navigation? Yeah, and, and so, yes, I did have uh, a pretty robust experience with navigation uh, prior to using this. I use, I, I, I use this, oh, I'm good. Yeah, I, I use this for, um, um, I use it for all my cortical screw constructs. Go ahead and come on in. Um, uh, prior to incorporation of robotics. What I found was, um, you know, we, our system, are, are, you know, I have eight partners. We typically run anywhere from six to 12 spine rooms a day at our center. And we could, we were constantly fighting over OR. So, you know, they, we were starting to get a little dirty in bookcases 30 minutes early and everybody was starting to fight for it at the beginning of the day. Um, and so I love it. I still use it in certain instances for C2 fixation, for multi-revision up in the cervical spine. But um, I've really fallen in love with this, this technology. And it was about case seven or eight before we, yeah, about case seven or eight before we really found that our fixation or our time was beating my navigation time. Nothing against the navigation. So if we look here, so again, not the easiest thing to check on uh, fluoro. I like a, a flat plate x-ray. Go ahead and come to a lateral. Um, go ahead and come to a lateral. So I love my S1, my L5s look good. The L4, I wanna check that left L4, but it's going through the pedicle. It starts medial and goes lateral to it. 
which is a lot of times if you have some rotation, these cortical screws, that's what it's going to look like. But uh, I'm happy with the fixation there and everything's been good. Can we come up with the table? So not knocking navigation. It was just a workflow that we were all fighting about. And when I got a new toy in the sandbox, uh, I felt like it was a great opportunity to utilize it and um, um, to utilize it and uh, not have to fight with it every, all day, every day, which uh, this is going to ultimately turn into that with my partners as well. And there is a little bit of asymmetric disc collapse that we saw in the, the preoperative CT and the x-ray. So our lateral uh, profile is probably not going to overlap, overlay perfectly, but you could see right there that we're not in the cranial disc. We've avoided that uh, cranial facet. Um, and I, I'm pretty happy with that fixation right there. So uh, Junior, you could come out and then Danny will have uh, Danny come in. All right, any other questions, Nicole? Yeah, Dr. Gunn, back to that question in comparison of uh, OR and install navigation to robotics, maybe in more uh, specific to the registration process, how it compares between OR to register for navigation versus the robot. Oh, you're saying scan and plan versus CT to 4 or you're saying just the use of the OM for navigation? Correct, for navigation. So, yeah, so, you know, from a timing perspective, we have felt that we beat that with the two fluoro shots instead. Um, what we, so, you know, the fact that you get three-dimensional navigation off 2D or 2D images, is, it's pretty amazing. Um, from my perspective, but you know, again, it was case seven or eight before we started to beat our our OR registration time. Um, and if I end up having to use the OR for scan and plan, it's not that big a deal. The biggest difference is, you know, in that setup is where your frame is. So when you're doing navigation, that frame is either in a perk pin in the pelvis or mounted on a spinous process. And it's, it's important for surgeons to understand that we have now removed that navigation frame and put it onto the robotic system, right? So if there is a translation in the patient, um, you, you, un, you need to understand where the nav information is, get, uh, is coming from. Some of the big deformity patients where we're putting, you know, multiple passes in the pedicle as far as cannulation, tap, screws, and we're doing it over several segments, sometimes we'll actually put the navigation frame onto the patient as well and get information or feedback from that perspective. So I still don't know if I answered the question uh, uh, very well, Nicole, but um, for the most mm -hmm. part, this this has been more efficient than um, my OR nav setup. And again, not to discard navigation and the benefits of it, but um, my goal was, one of my short-term goals was to be able to beat that workflow with regards to time. All right. yeah, thank you, Dr. Gunn. You absolutely yeah, yeah. answered that question. Well, yeah. yeah, and maybe just one final question before we close. Um, where do you see the future of robotics headed, specifically Mazor? Uh, and should any surgeon on the line wait um, until further development to adopt robotics, or is now the time um, to get on board with the technology? Yeah, so I would love to talk about that for about five hours because I'm pretty passionate about where this is gonna take us. Um, uh, without getting myself or you guys in trouble, I, uh, I will say this is here to stay and it's gonna be a big part of what our ORs look like in the future. Um, and and that, that part of it's very easy to answer um, as far as the timing of it. And, and I'm happy if somebody has true questions about that and wants to talk offline, uh, not under Medtronic time, I would welcome any sort of phone call or email and with a hop on a line of, of really where this technology is going to take us because I'll, I'll promise you five years from now, our OR is going to look drastically different and this is going to be a big part of it. Um, as far as timing, you know, a lot of people say, hey, well, what's, what's the benefit? I don't have a problem hitting my pedicle screws or my fixation now. And in and theory, that's that's the benefit of this uh, at current state. You know, I wanted to be a big part of the future. And I think folks that are, are typically a little younger in practice that are looking forward 10 years from now or 20 years from now, 
I would, there's no reason why the way, right? The more comfortable you get with it, the more you understand the technology, the more it benefits your workflow and your patients. And so there's absolutely no reason to wait in my mind. Um, there would definitely be some iterations of software and potentially the, the hardware component of it down the road. But uh, I, I would say if, if you have the opportunity to jump on board and start feeling the benefits of it as soon as possible. Well, thank All you right. so much, Dr. John. Yep. And thank you thank so you. much to everybody else for jumping on today. Yeah, thank you guys on the line. And again, thanks everyone.